One of the greatest problems we face today is loneliness, certainly in the West. Uh, there was an article in uh, a national paper some while ago, uh, actually before the coronavirus, and it said, loneliness is killing us. We must start treating this disease. And around that time, another newspaper uh, carried a similar article, and it said, loneliness is not just a problem for old people, but the young are lonely too. And then that article went on to speak uh, about the connection between loneliness and mental health issues, such as anxiety uh, and depression uh, and so on. Now, the reason for that is because God has created us as social beings. We were not designed to be lonely. We were designed for community. And, of course, at the highest expression of that, Christian fellowship, to be one with God and to be one with each other. Now, with that in mind, I want us to see this morning just how much of a danger the pandemic is to us spiritually. Now, we who are Christians, our, our, our future is secure, and, and we don't have the fear of the future and, and of death as the unbeliever does. Uh, but there are dangers that we have to avoid and be aware of as Christians. But I want us to see how we can still have impact in these days. On these days which we feel are unfortunate days, we need to see actually they are days of opportunity, but we need wisdom to know how to handle the days. It was the men of Issachar, we're told, who understood their days and knew what they should do. We, we do need to be those men of Issachar for our day. But it's vital that we, we build on the foundation that's uh, trustworthy. So we, we go right the way back to the Bible. As Christians, we know very well that all the trouble started back in Genesis 3. That's why we had our reading in Genesis chapter 3. Now, the, the opening scene in, in Genesis is what I call hide and seek. Um, we see that that, uh, that first act of rebellion in the Garden of Eden was where all the trouble began. We won't understand our world, we won't understand where we are today, apart from going back time and time again to Genesis chapter 3. Um, after taking that forbidden fruit, that that guilty pair are changed forever. There's Adam and there is Eve, there are our first parents, and from that day on, nothing will be the same. And so instantly, they are overwhelmed with guilt. The God that they loved, the God that they uh, enjoyed fellowship with, instantly there is a, 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 a sword that comes down. There is separation. And what colossal darkness must have fallen a, a, upon them in an instant. Um, what, um, what horror, the, the, the madness of sin, the irrationality of sin must have broken upon them. And in that minute, everything was to change forever. Uh, and in the twinkling of an eye, just in the flash, everything changes. And, uh, but worst of all must be that separation. We're told that a, a flaming sword comes down to keep them from the presence of God. So sin enters the world and there is separation. Separation between man and God, separation between man and his fellow man. So we go back to Genesis chapter 3 and we see the tragedy of, of separation. Now, although in Genesis 3 we see man hiding from God, it's significant, I think, that Scripture speaks of God hiding and revealing from that day. Just a few examples. In Isaiah, Isaiah 54 and, and verse 8, we read this. God says, In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have compassion on you. But that's the verse that I, I hid my face 
from you. Still in Isaiah, in Isaiah 64, and, and there we find in verse 7, No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and made us waste away because of our sins. So there is God hiding. God hides himself. And maybe um, in, in Matthew 11, this is an important one here in terms of God hiding and revealing. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, you can feel the heaviness of his heart when he's gone to these Galilean villages and he's been rejected. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty five. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. So there is God and this whole context of separation, God hiding at times, and then God revealing. But then on the same kind of theme, in the scripture we read of God speaking or being silent. So God speaks and reveals, of course, generally through, through creation. God, God, we're told, is speaking, he's preaching all the time to the whole world. It's, it's only love that reveals so God is the God of revelation and, and he's revealing and Psalm 19 brings this out so clearly. It's split up into to two sections and the first section is God's revelation through creation. And so we read in Psalm 19 verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they display knowledge. God is the supreme preacher and he's preaching day and night, uh, all the time, never stops. God is the preacher and that revelation through creation. Of course, the second half of the psalm, it speaks about God revealing through his word. God speaking through his word. But then, the other side of the coin are God's silences. So just as God hides and reveals, God speaks, and then he's silent. So back in Isaiah again, in Isaiah um, 42 now, this is the, the, the silence of God, uh, Isaiah 42 and verse 14. For a long time, I have kept silent. I've been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out. So he goes on. But the point I'm making there is God is keeping silent. There is a time when he speaks, but there is a time when he chooses to be silent. Then, then Job, just one more, in, in, in Job 34, now, we know Job's plight here, how he, God uh, so loves this man, and yet he goes through these dreadful times of, of testing. Now, here's one of his so-called friends, but God, speaking through um, Elihu, that was one of the, the three friends, this is Job 34 and verse 29, but if, if he, that if God remains silent, who can condemn him? If he hides his face, who can see him? So again, there is an awareness all through Scripture that God is the God who speaks or is silent. He, he, he hides or he reveals, but that same um, kind of, of, of theme. But the point is, it's the pain of separation and, and, and distance, of, of non-communication. Maybe the most famous one, this is Luke 23 and verse 9. This is the Lord Jesus Christ during that awful time before the cross when he's taken from pillar to post. And here he is now before Pilate, who is plying him with, with questions. 
And so here we have it, uh, Luke 23, verse 9. Pilate plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. He was silent. He chose not to defend himself, not to give any explanations, but he just remained silent. So this is just a, a background, if you like, to the, the non-communication, to how, in a sense, how unnatural it is not to have that flow of, of communication. Uh, and so whether it's between God and man, and, or, or man and his fellow man, it, it is not the natural thing. It is, got, it is not God's original intention, if we can say that, because there, were, there, sh there should have been no separation whatsoever. So the pain of separation, the pain of non-communication, but that's what makes reconciliation all the more precious. Um, surely one of the sweetest words is reconciliation. When there has been separation, when there has been distance, when there has been no communication. And Ernest Hemingway, the writer, um, wrote a short story called The Capital of the World. And in this story, um, there's a, a young man called Paco. Now, uh, Paco was one of those common names, like, like, like John, and our John, and, but, but here's this young man, Paco, who uh, is a bit of a rebel. Um, he's itching to get away from home. Um, itching to get away from the, uh, the control, as he saw it, of his father, with the influence of his dad. Uh, he longs to be a matador, so he, he leaves home, he goes away from home in a bit of a huff, and goes to Madrid, the capital, and um, seeks to make his, his fortune, and his fame and fortune, there. His father's heartbroken, and after some while he decides to go to Madrid, to follow his son, try and find his son. And so he puts, out of des desperation, he puts an advert in the local newspaper. Uh, and, and it reads, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the Madrid newspaper office tomorrow at noon. All is forgiven. I love you. And then Hemingway then writes that the next day at noon, in front of the newspaper office, there were 800 Pacos or seeking forgiveness. It's the longing of the human heart to be reconciled, even though it can't be put in, into words. It is, the, it is the absolute bliss of being reconciled, of having all the wrongs put aside and being brought together. This is the glory of the gospel. This is the joy of reconciliation. Um, Wesley wrote, we sing it at Christmas time, um, heart the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth, mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. There is no more glorious message in all the world than the gospel of Jesus Christ, where God goes seeking people, where, where God has this message of reconciliation. The world turns its back on God. I've got no time for you. I'm closing my ears. I'm closing my eyes. I'm running on ahead of you. But God comes and he seeks. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost. And the ultimate price, price is paid on Calvary, where there he, he dies being punished for our sin, being punished for rebels, and, and yet he's seeking us by his Spirit, and that's how he does it today. Jesus Christ is still seeking the lost today by his Holy Spirit in his people. The same urgency, the same desire for reconciliation to bridge that gap is found in God's heart expressed through his people. So, of course, the challenge of reconciliation is firstly vertical, because that's where it begins. We have to make our peace with God, and then we're in a position to be the real peacemakers and make peace with our, our fellow men. So, we were not created to be in isolation from others. And that's what makes this time so difficult that we, we, we don't like isolation 
and, and some have had to be um, isolated longer than others. And, and you know who you are. <laughs> you know how painful you found it. And uh, I know at this time there were those who have been um, freshly released, those, those who were having to shield, um, have, have been released into a world now. And, and so it's not natural to be tucked away. Now, the great challenge for, for those of us who are Christians at this time is that we've been given the great commission to, to reach out with, with love to a world around us. And, uh, uh, and this is why the incarnation is so important, that God actually came down. God didn't send an angel. He, he didn't just give a, a book, as some uh, say about us, you Christians, you, you just got a book. No, God himself came into our world. The, the living God took flesh and became one of us to get among us, not to be at a distance, not to be aloof, and so we see when we look at the life of Jesus, actually, he, he touches the lepers. You know, there, there is that desire to reach out. So we see Jesus actually touching lepers. Jesus coming to the blind, touching them, putting his fingers on, on their eyes. He's, he's the God who comes near to us. He, he was not aloof. He, he wasn't distant. And so we see him, besides his teaching, he's feeding the hungry and he's uh, driving out demons, and he's, he's healing the sick. And I think the great peril that we face at this time that we've got a battle against, it, uh, uh, this time it encourages the recluse in us all. And some of us battle with this more than, more than others. You know, we feel almost a relief in, in being recluses. You know, I, 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 can't, I, I know I often tell you this but but by nature I'm, I'm a shy person so it isn't it, it, it's a, it takes an effort for me to, to speak to people and, and, and to reach out and, and so there is the, the danger of this pandemic is it just feeds the inner recluse in many of us so what are we to do then what are we to do because we've got to pray about new ways of, of being able to contact people and communicate with people and reach out to people. Um, well, certainly from a fellowship point of view, it's a challenge, isn't it? You know, and sometimes at the elders' meetings, we're, we're scratching our heads. We're, we're, we're saying, Lord, how can we um, not just reach others ourselves, but encourage the, the fellowship to, to, to reach out? It is this whole body thing. We can't rely upon a pastor or the leaders. This is the, where the body of Christ has to be earnestly seeking God, saying, Lord, what can I do? And every one of you, you saying, Lord, what can I do? Not hide behind the pandemic, but say, Lord, what can I do? And we can't do everything and we can't reach everyone, but we need to pray for specific Holy Spirit burdens to reach certain people. So we don't feel the guilt of not being able to do everything and reach everyone, but we're asking God who is gracious and wise and will equip us to reach the right people and do the right thing. And you, we've all got different ministries and not everyone is an evangelist and not everyone you know, does this and that and the other. It's the body of Christ in all its beauty and, and various giftings and form. Um, we can all be encouragers, can't we? Although there might be those who have a certain gift of encouragement, we're all to be encouragers and to think of ways of reaching out. Are there new ways? Now, I, I guess we're living in days of social media and, and we've got Facebook and we've got texting and email. And, but, you know, I, a particular thing upon my heart that there's something special about writing a letter. Isn't it a joy now when you actually get a letter in the post and it's got a human being's writing on it? You know, it hasn't just gone through a machine, but someone's gone to the bother to actually write to me. And, and wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a revival of letter writing where we sit down and we prayerfully write to a person? 
and they can say, isn't this lovely? And, and think about a letter, you can go back to it, you can get it out, and some of you maybe have love letters that were written to you, and you keep them in a little ribbon wrapped around. You're not saying we should go into love letter writing, although, men, come on, get romantic again. But, uh, but there's something about actually writing to someone, taking the time to write a, a, a letter, but then to be encouraged just by the way we live for Jesus, just to encourage each other by our lifestyle. And maybe you don't even realise it. Maybe you're doing that right now and you've got no idea what an encouragement you are. I remember one little lady in our, uh, our first church in Wales, in the valleys, um, had no idea what an encourager she was. Her name was Mavis. She was a frail little thing. She had this awful uh, brittle bone disease where she was confined to a chair day and night. So all she could do was sit in the chair. She couldn't lie down at night time. She had to sit in the chair, otherwise her bones would break. I would go to see her. She was, there, was no, uh, there was no fat on her. She was just flesh and bone. But with these twinkling eyes and massive smile, she had everything to complain about. But boy, I used to leave that place doing cartwheels. What an encourager. So what I'm saying is maybe you think, well, I, I don't have the gift of encouragement, but in your very being, by the very way you live for Jesus Christ, you are an encourager. But, you know, I think, again, think of challenges that we face. You know, for years we've been saying, come to church and hear the gospel, which was never biblical anyway, when Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. We're having to think, how can we reach out now with the gospel? Now, again, this is where the body of Christ is vital. The church is always at its most effective when every single believer is a witness for Jesus. So we're not talking about people being evangelists here, although in a sense that's what we are. Now I, we, we love to read the accounts and, and they're the great encouraged people like Dale Moody. You know, we need to be encouraged by certain people who it was their gifting, but they can encourage us to be bold. And I was always challenged by one story of Dale Moody, you know, the American evangelist, and he was an extrovert. Okay, we're not all Dale Moody's, but he made a covenant with God that he would witness to one unbeliever every day. And, and he, wouldn't, wouldn't to go to, he wouldn't go to bed before speaking to one person. Now, on this one particular night, it was 10 p.m. and he'd not shared the gospel with anyone. So he, he goes out into the street and um, he lived in um, Chicago, I think, at the time. And he buttonholes this, button this poor person going by under a lamppost. And, and, that, that, and he said to him, uh, are you a Christian? Are you going to heaven? The man was so offended, he wanted to hit um, uh, Moody and put him in the gutter, he said. But um, anyway, uh, Moody <laughs> managed to get it over with. And anyway, um, after that, the elders of the church heard about this, this young deal, Moody, uh, and they rebuked him for his lack of wisdom. And so, you know, Moody went away with the tail between his legs, but three months later, he worked in the YMCA. Three months later, this man came into the YMCA. He said, I was so convicted about your words. And he gave his life to Christ there and then and became a real worker in the church. Now, we're not all deal Moody's, but if we all feel something of the responsibility of realizing without Jesus, people are going to hell. It's as simple as that. The Apostle Paul, you know, you know the, um, the famous... Verses, Romans 10. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What a promise. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's God's promise. How then can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe on the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they're sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You have beautiful feet. When you go to someone and tell them about Jesus, you've been sent by Jesus Christ. Now, however you do this, 
However you communicate the good news, it's your beautiful feet that God wants to use. So that's the challenge today, that um, we're living at this time where it seems to be everything is closing down. Everything, it gives us every excuse to close ourselves down. But we need to reach out in the name of Jesus Christ. Did you ever pray, play um, it at school? Or, or tag, you might have called it. And it would start with one person. So one person would run around the playground and touch, touch somebody else, and they would join you, then they touch somebody else. In the end, I remember there was this whole mass of people, the, play, the, play, the, the playground almost filled with people who were the chasers and poor one little person left. But wouldn't that be wonderful if the church was like that? That we go on, we, we, we touch another and we touch another and so there's this massive great crowd and those who do not believe are in the minority. Well, that is the challenge to us today. How can we overcome all the temptations that we face just to hide away and keep ourselves when God has wired us to communicate his love and his good news? Let's pray. Father, we confess that the very thought of these things cause us to fear and our hearts to increase because we there's something in us that wants to hide away that doesn't want to take the risk of reaching out maybe being snubbed or even uh, reaching out to encourage and not being welcomed as we wanted but lord we pray you would enable us to to crucify our selfish sinful nature and holy spirit we pray that you would lead us and direct us not to be overwhelmed with things that we can't do, but to be dependent upon you and to be equipped to do the things that you want us to do. Help us to know what those things are. Hear us, Father, and help us, because we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.